Hello and welcome to Read All About It, the podcast where people talk about their favourite and not-so-favourite books. Join me, Paul Cuddihy, as I take each guest on the literary journey of their life, from their most cherished childhood read and a book they'd recommend to anyone, to the book they couldn't be paid to read again, and much more in between. So listen, enjoy, subscribe and spread the word about the Read All About It podcast. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Read All About It podcast and I'm delighted to be joined by the writer Ian Maloney. Now Ian is an editor and he lectures on writing in Japan. He has degrees in English from Aberdeen University and creative writing from Glasgow University and he's also published three novels, The Waves Burn Bright, Silma Hill and First Time Solo. He also reviews regularly for a number of publications, including the Japan Times. He moved from Scotland in 2005 and lives in Japan with his wife, Minori. And in March 2020, he's published a new book, The Only Gaijin in the Village uh, with Polygon, and that charts a year of his life living in rural Japan. Ian, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Paul. And obviously people will be able to tell right away that uh, you are actually not in Japan at the moment, no. but you've been <laughs> over on a book tour in, in your current stop is, is Glasgow for the I Write Festival. Yeah, yeah, that's on tonight as we record. Um, yeah, I'm over for the whole of March. Um, virus is willing. <laughs> I'll be around. Um, yeah, travelling around, promoting the book and getting rained on. <laughs> now, I, obviously the book... You know, it does chart your year of of living in in rural Japan. You've stayed in the country for a number of years, but you obviously moved away from the urban centre to more rural centre. But it's interesting when you read the book, and I I was lucky enough, you were kind enough to send me a copy of the book, and it's interesting, I'm guessing, you know, when they say home is where the heart is, and and home for you now is Japan, and that really comes across in the book. Yeah, yeah, Japan's Japan's my home now, it's where I live. It it doesn't make my mother too happy when I say, I'm going home now, I mean... (laughs) Japan, but um, Scotland's still home as well. It's uh, I think it's possible to have more than one home. So yeah. Aber- Aberdeen is my home, and Gifu in Japan is my home. And I, mean, I think you can, that kind of comes across yeah. in the book as well. The fact that you almost like not quite dual nationality, but the idea that you can have that kind of identity as you know a Scot in Japan, or, or like you feel Japanese or part of that country and that culture, but obviously you're still, you're still a pool of Scotland as well. Yeah, it's not, I don't think home is a sort of geographic thing, it's more, yeah, where the heart is, it's more Aberdeen's where my memories are, it's where my parents live, and um, Japan is, is where I feel comfortable, it's where I've settled down, it's where I've bought a house and, and made a home, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a nice split, it's nice having the duality and being able to experience, well, I think we're lucky enough to live in a time where you know air travel is so cheap and yeah. easy, even if it does damage the environment, that that kind of lifestyle is possible now. I think as well when people read the book, there's, it's kind of very visual and people, you can, you know, you paint a really good picture of, particularly when you're, you're sitting outside with a beer yeah. in front of your, your, your fire outside and you just have, mm-hmm. I always had this vision of just this beautiful view that you can just actually just sit and appreciate and you know it's maybe your life's taking this unexpected turn that you never when you're in Aberdeen never thinking this is where I'm going to end up and, and settle. Yeah I certainly never thought I'd settle there I am um, when I was younger I never really I didn't watch Japanese movies or read and uh, read manga or watch anime or anything like that I just sort of went out with the intention of staying for a year and traveling afterwards and then fell in love with the country fell in love with the girl and that was that stayed there but yeah the my fire pit is probably the the best part of it just sitting there with a view over the rice fields and yeah and uh yeah having a beer and there is a really nice bit in, in the book as well where uh, i think it's your first fire of the year and, you, and you're outside and it's cold your wife's inside because it's freezing <coughs> yeah <laughs> and so you're quite enjoying it and then some of your neighbours just suddenly it's just they just it's very cinematic actually where you just say <laughs> they just appear and then there's this kind of community of everybody the guys just sitting around having a beer around this fire and I think that's so nice yeah there's that curiosity of what's this weird foreigner doing <laughs> sitting in the snow let's let's go over and check it out and then because the fire's going it's not actually that cold and, and yeah it's just nice everybody's everybody there has been very welcoming and uh, and very friendly and my Japanese is good enough that we can. Sit around and have a yeah. chat and, and things like that. It's not great. I'm not perfect, but yeah, it's good enough for that. Mm-hmm. No doubt, in the course of this conversation, we'll, we'll talk about the book as well as as your other novels as well. But obviously, I'm taking you back on 
your own literary journey and, and if we go right back to, to childhood and interesting when the, when you give me the choice of your favourite book from childhood when you actually sent me the list in brackets it was yes really so you, <laughs> yes. Can, you can tell everybody what you chose yeah I chose for my strangely for my childhood book um, Spike Milligan's uh, Mussolini his part in my downfall which is the the fourth part of his his war diaries it took me a long time to to work out which one to choose it's a it's a difficult question that one favorite book from childhood because how do you define childhood mm-hmm. you know there's there's books i remember reading when i was very young Roald Dahl and Dick Kingsmith and those those kind of writers and i remember them Roald Dahl in particular being very important to me but i don't really have much memory of actually reading the books and and the stories and things like that it's more just the nostalgia of the cover like my my nieces about one and a half just now and you know thinking about Christmas and birthdays what books to buy Mm -hmm. hair and just looking at the covers going oh I used to love that one but beyond that I wouldn't have much to say about those books but I found um, I found Spike Milligan's book on my parents bookshelves when I was about I guess about 10 or 11 that kind of age so we had a lot of books in the house other other guests on this podcast have spoken about this as well, having lots of books and having parents who are not censoring what they yeah. read and that kind of thing. Just pull something off the shelf and read it. So they were like that with books. They were also like that with my my dad's record collection. You know, pull stuff off and put it on, and you know he had Led Zeppelin records and things like that. So I would just do that, pull stuff off and find things that I found, like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Lord of the Rings and those kind of books. But yeah, I pulled um, Spike Milligan off the shelf. And I don't know to this day, actually, why they only had the fourth one in the right. series. That, that was one of, I was wondering why, out of all those seven that you chose Yeah, that one, it, it, was, it was the first one I read. And I'd never heard of him. I didn't know about the goons, and I hadn't come across his poetry or anything like that. It was just, I pulled it off, and there was a, it was a paperback edition with a funny cartoon of like a caricature Spike with a bowl of spaghetti upside down on his head. Right. And it was like... That's you know that's funny. It's it's an interesting cover, and I um, started to read it, and I've sort of never stopped reading it since. I reread it. Well, I reread the whole series quite frequently. It's just first of all, it's just hilarious. It's it's a very very funny book. You know, he's the comedian that inspired most of the other comedians of the twentieth yeah. century. Inspired Monty Python and all those people, and um, some of it hasn't dated well it has to be said you know he's very much of his generation but the the comedy the humor there just really tickled me it sort of it probably shaped a lot of my humor but it also was just on on the right level for me a lot of spike's humor is quite childish so because yeah. i liked when when i was just checking and there was a list of all seven books and then when it came to the fourth one Mussolini has part of my down, downfall and it says this was announced as the fourth part of his quote increasingly misnamed trilogy yeah. <laughs> so that kind of right away that tells you yeah yeah it's that, that kind of attitude and it's it's an interesting it's an interesting series because it was dismissed at the time of publication as being kind of an un, I think Clive James called it an unreliable history of the war so it's all about his time as a soldier as a gunner in the Royal Artillery during the Second World War and after, and yeah, it was sort of dismissed as as not being reliable, as him taking liberties with with the truth for entertainment, which he probably did. The conversations are very much like scripts from the Goon Show rather than natural conversations, but it was all about his experiences. And um, interestingly, I was just listening to another podcast, um, "We Have Ways of Making You Talk," which is Al Murray's podcast on the second world war and he was talking about the book as being actually a very reliable history of what it was like being a soldier fighting in north africa and Mm -hmm. in italy during the second world war surely if it's your memoir i mean it's not by its very nature it's not a definitive history it's it's your experience of any particular in this case the second world war yeah i think it's kind of something i struggled with a bit when I was writing my memoir as well is how far can you go in shaping the stories and turn them you know basically my book is a lot of it is a collection of anecdotes I've been telling people Mm -hmm. in in pubs and things over the years and anecdotes are necessarily structured to make people laugh at the end usually or make them cry or or whatever it might be 
And it's a sort of sliding scale between this, you know, this is just the cold hard facts, which can be a bit boring, so we shape it a bit to make it more interesting. And I think with Spike sometimes he did get a bit carried away with the shaping. And go, I can make this better, I can make it funnier. And it's, uh, as you see, I wrote three novels before doing this one. I was a fiction writer first. And that part of the brain is always on when I was doing the memoir of, oh, I could take this and this yeah. and that would make a great plot. And The thing is, if you if your memoir, if it doesn't, if it's not you, if your personality doesn't come out of it or mm. people, when they're reading it, don't get to know a wee bit about you or, or your wife or where you're staying or the characters in it, they're not going to read it. Yeah. You know, you have to structure it in a way that you're giving a wee bit of yourself. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. No, nobody would want to read either just a diary of today I did this, today I did this, or a sort of cold factual account of I moved to Japan and yeah. that kind of story. So yeah, there's that, there's that aspect of it which, which has always, I guess, shaped how I approached this book. Um, the other interesting thing that has stuck with me from, from Mussolini, from that particular book, is so the series starts off with Hitler, my part in his downfall. So it's how Spike fought Hitler. Mm -hmm. you know, a grandiose hyperbolic claim. And Mussolini is his part in my downfall because Spike was uh, wounded in Italy. He got, I think, a mortar exploded quite near him. And he got what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder. At that time, he, he, well, in his words, he was bomb happy. Mm -hmm. That's how he called it. So he was injured and he... He writes very movingly, very eloquently about what it feels like to have post-traumatic stress disorder, about he would just start crying uncontrollably and not even really know why. And um, at that time and in that, in that situation, you know, being in the army in Italy, in the middle of, it was the Monte Cassino battle, one of the biggest battles of the war, you know, a man, a man in uniform just suddenly starting to cry doesn't go down very well. So he was sort of invalided out. So Spike's kind of got this reputation as just being stupid, surreal, comedy, kind of silly stuff. But that book in particular is is very moving, very beautifully written. And was a big, again, was a big kind of behind-the-scenes influence. My third novel was about post-traumatic stress disorder. So I guess early on in my reading, that yeah. idea was, was planted in there. Because you mentioned, as you say, like some of the other guests living in a house full of books but more than more than that just the fact that what your parents were doing were, was encouraging curiosity yeah. and that nothing was off limits that actually it was up to you to then go and investigate so it all probably makes you a, a more curious and uh, a more rounded reader which is a maybe they weren't consciously thinking that at the time but actually that's what ends up happening yeah i mean they, they would they would push their own favorite things you know my dad was a big lord of the rings fan so read that read that but yeah there was certainly certainly none of it in a negative way of oh don't read that that's too old for you yeah you're right it's just curiosity of um i listened to the, the episode of this with willie mailey where he was he was talking about just that idea of just open a book read it like you can't have an opinion on a book or on a genre or on a writer until you've read it yeah and um it's that that curiosity yeah that starts starts early if you just leave things around kids will eventually get bored and go oh, what's this if we take you on then from Spike Milligan your next step forward then is more teenage formative years and it? it's uh, an Ian Banks novel that you've chosen it is yeah yeah um, Complicity which is the the first one of his I read when I would have been I was trying to work it out today on the way here I would have been about 14 I think when I came across it and I can remember the moment I'd never heard of Ian Banks and I didn't I didn't read that widely of Scottish writers mm -hmm. at all at that time. I had, I had an audio book. It's funny. A lot of these episodes, um, people mention Robert Louis Stevenson early on, and, and I had a like a kids abridged audio book of Treasure Island. Right. So that that was a, that was a big thing. But because I was just pulling things off shelves and then going to the library as well, we'd go every weekend. It never really occurred to me to think about where writers were from. You know, I'm reading an American writer or a Scottish writer, but. When I was around 14, I guess I was becoming more more aware of the world and more sort of politically aware as well. And I was really into a heavy metal band from Glasgow called The Almighty, which were, they were pretty big at the time and they were a fantastic band, sadly no longer around, They've pretty much been forgotten. But they, in 1994, they released an album called Crank that was, that was quite political. It was like 
punk heavy metal and very political songs and they were it was around the time this is going back but it was around the time of the the criminal justice act and there was protests about that and they were part of it they had all their artwork for singles and things were like stop this mm -hmm. stop this bill that was mainly to stop young people congregating and having raves and things like that so i was listening to that album and reading interviews with them and in one of the interviews where they were talking about their own politics and their own kind of political awakening. The singer, Ricky Warwick, said that one of his favourite books was Complicity by Ian Banks. And I was like, oh, I've never heard of that guy. I'm going, my, this is my favourite band. That's yeah. their favourite author. I'll go and check this out. So I went and got it. And yeah, fantastic book. Probably Banks is most overtly political. And he was, he was quite a political writer. And that was me. That was me hooked on it. It was, it was the first one by then, Devoured. Yeah. Was I like that idea that, you know, like obviously... You see, your parents may have recommended books or friends, but just the fact that it's almost it's someone who, in, in a different genre, in a different kind of art, art form, you admire or, or, or you're, you're a fan. So you think, well, I, that leap, I like, I like them. Well, if they like him, then so must I. So yeah, it's, it's good when that happens. Yeah, it's all the crossover. It's you know, I, I never understand people that like I only like film or I only like music and that's my thing. It's they they all feed into yeah, each other. Yeah. You learn about bands from watching a film and hearing a song and the soundtrack. And, oh, what's that? And in investigating it. And you know, now you get you get writers write about their favorite bands as, as well. So Ian Rankin will mention Mogwai or Bell and Sebastian or whoever in in one of his Rebus novels, and people find bands that way. And yeah, for me, it was. Uh, Finding Ian Banks through through the Almighty, and and if they're listening, then I'm sure that you would love nothing better <laughs> better than for them to reform as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think uh, they're all certainly Ricky Warwick still playing in bands and yeah. his, and that kind of thing. But yeah, Complicity is just an amazing book. It's often very difficult for to write about politics and the kind of politics that make you angry. And, and Banks was quite an angry man when it came to politics. He famously burnt his passport and sent it to number 10 when Blair was Prime Minister in protest at the, the Iraq War. Right. Um, and he wrote in, in his book, Raw Spirit, he's supposed to be travelling around Scotland visiting whiskey distilleries and it's just peppered with rants about, about the Blair government and, and the Iraq War. And it's often very hard to turn that into convincing fiction a good story because the soapbox stuff kind of gets in the way of a good plot and a good character but with complicity it's so brilliantly built into the plot that it's a it's a sort of murder mystery of an ex-soldier getting revenge on people who have kind of try to think of a way to do it without spoiling the story <laughs> but yeah kind of getting revenge on people who have put soldiers lives in danger or that kind of thing arms manufacturers yeah. and, and government people that kind of thing and it's a fantastic book, just just for characterisation and plot. But it also taught me a lot. I didn't realise this until later, but that book and Ian Banks generally taught me a lot about writing and about technique. You know, whenever a murder happens in the book, it switches into second person. You you go into the mm -hmm. house, you go up the stairs, and that can, it's, it's a really powerful technique that that can be a bit overused. But that was the first time I sort of came across it. So, Complicity by Ian Banks, as recommended by Ian Maloney and the Almighty. <laughs> you mentioned there, just in terms of writing, that you've become aware of a sense of a writer's identity. And just given what we started talking about in terms of where you see your home now, and is that something that you wouldn't want to identify as a, a Scottish writer, or are you just a writer in, in a kind of global sense? I'm definitely a Scottish writer. There's, there's a lot of, in my writing and in my voice that is Scottish, but... I think that can be a positive thing. It's not used to, you know, only Scottish people can read me, not that kind of thing. Hopefully um, my writing is also universal, as as, um, as all writing should be. Yeah, those labels, they can, be, they can be problematic. I mean, when you talk about, like, women writers or women's fiction, stuff like that, it's, it, can be, it can be used to categorise people and sort of shunt them to one side a bit. So that, yeah, that kind of... Using identity as a way of categorising writers can be problematic, but because it was interesting when I was because obviously some people might be aware of the the waves burn bright, for example, mm -hmm. which was about the a novel based on the, the Piper Alpha yeah. disaster. But then even the other, you know, like when I was looking at Selma Hill, the, the, some of the it was just one comparison. You know, it's compared to some classic Scottish literature. So James Hogg 
private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner, George Douglas Brown, The House of Green Shutters, James Kelman, How Late It Was, How Late. Yeah. Which again, if you're if you're reading that as a, as a writer, you, you must be thinking, my goodness, yeah. I've done something right here. <laughs> yeah, you know, if, you, if, you, if your name's mentioned, even just by one person in, in with that company, it's, yeah, it's flattering, it's humbling, it's it's wonderful. I've always found that I, I write a lot of reviews and it's I try to avoid that comparison thing. Mm-hmm. You know, this writer is like this writer is like this writer because no writer is like any other writer. Every you know it's what you're saying before about voice and memoirs and your personality. Even if you're writing crime fiction or science fiction or whatever, the writer's personality and voice will come through. So everything's different, but. It's often a nice shorthand to say, yeah. you know, if you if you like people who like this book also liked. Yeah, as long as it doesn't put, I think, as long as it doesn't put pressure on a writer, because I always think, for example, in a sometimes in a football context, if a young player comes through, the worst thing that MD can uh, do is say he's the new Kenny Dalglish, he's the new Messi or whoever, yeah. and you think just just let him be the new himself, and I think yeah. sometimes with writers as well, as long as you don't go, I'm never going to live up to those expectations, but I'll be, yeah. I'll take yeah. it in the, the positive manner. Yeah, nobody's ever going to be the new James Kelman. It's yeah, you know, there's James exactly, Kelman. Exactly, exactly. So, but yeah, you can. I'll, I'm happy just being Ian Maloney. Yeah, <laughs> doing that. That's, that's, that's fair enough. I mean, with three <laughs> novels and a memoir behind you yeah. already, that's at, at some point. What, what I think you really want, you know, you've made it when at some point you read a review and somebody go, "This is very. This is he's the new Ian Maloney." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that hasn't happened yet, but you know, fingers crossed. You, you never, you never know. <laughs> You are listening to the Read All About It podcast with me, Paul Cardin, and my guest is the writer Ian Maloney. And Ian, we're on to question three, and that's a book that you'd recommend to anyone. Yeah, this this is, a, as some of your previous guests have pointed out, this is a difficult question because, you know, how do you define is it a book that, that anyone would read or just a book that you absolutely love and, and think they should share? It took me a long time to decide on something. So I love I love David Mitchell. I love Ali Smith. Um, they're probably my two favourite writers. So I'd say to anyone, anyone, read all of David Mitchell's books, read all of Ali Smith's books. But they don't need me recommending yeah. them. You know, <clears throat> people who read know who they are. They're, they're big name writers. They have big publishing companies with big marketing budgets to promote their books. So I picked um, a book called Belka, Why Don't You Bark? by Furukawa Hideo the Japanese writer. And I picked it because, per- firstly, because it's amazing. It's just a fantastic book. But also, it, it's not very widely known. I read a lot of Japanese literature and I write about a lot of Japanese literature um, for a few outlets, including the Japan Times. And it's it's kind of a shame that... So Japanese literature is famous and it's people read a lot of Japanese authors, but always within quite a narrow category there's the Murakami Haruki and Yoshimoto Banana and these these kind of writers break through but there's you know there's a whole literature there that really doesn't get noticed and it's it's difficult for writers like we were just saying about the, the new James Kelman however Japanese writers when they get translated into English it's always the new Haruki Murakami mm-hmm. or the new um, Banana Yoshimoto if they're Roman they've got to be quirky they've got to be weird little bits of supernatural stuff that kind of thing and that's just one very narrow very narrow aspect of it it's like if, if Scottish literature was only translated into Japanese they only translated crime novels and nothing else so I, I want to just big up this book and yeah. say you know, it's out there everybody should read it if I were a betting man which I'm not I would put money on Hideo Furukawa winning the Nobel one day. He's really? he's that good, he's that amazing. He reminds me a bit, completely contradicting what I just said about not comparing writers, but he reminds me a bit of uh, Don DeLillo. That kind of, he's got that kind of scope, yeah. but with a, an amazing writing style and an amazing sense of humour. And Is that one of the many benefits for you of, of living in Japan now that you're discovering literature that probably, as you say, if you were still over here... You would be oblivious to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, when I when I first moved out there, because I knew nothing about Japan when I left Scotland, I started reading histories and culture books and the literature, and I read Murakami and and these kind of people, and then just kept getting deeper and deeper mm-hmm. into it. And then one of the joys of reviewing is that once um, once your name's out there, 
publishers start sending you stuff and you get the free books in advance and Which then for any readers just it's, it's the it's best great. thing well, now I will never get bored of a, a free book landing on my doorstep although it's often the ebooks now which is it's still nice to have them but yeah, it's still it's physical ones better, yeah, yeah you want you want that yeah and this this one Belka it's it's a very very strange concept for a book so um it starts with Laika who was the the Russian dog that was um, sent into space. He was the first, he was certainly the first dog in space and went up before people. I can't remember who was the first animal at all. Um, but Laika didn't come back. They sent him up in one of the Sputniks. He orbited the Earth and died up there. Then they sent up two other dogs, Belka and Strelka, and um, they came back. They were the first creatures to successfully orbit the Earth and then land again and come back. So Furukawa takes that as kind of the start point of the novel of these two space dogs that then breed, they have children, and they mix with other sort of impressive dogs around the world. And this this part part of this is true, that one of the puppies produced by Belka, I think, was um, presented to JFK by Khrushchev during that right, period. Right. So these, these puppies were, you know, they were the, the pride of Russia at the time, pride of the Soviet Union. So the book kind of follows the descendants of these dogs as they spread around around the earth. So the dogs are the main characters or are there human characters? There are human characters as well. So there's a parallel story set in Russia but involving kind of Japanese Yakuza and um, a little girl who's the, the daughter of a, a Yakuza boss that ends up through various twists in the middle of, I think it's Siberia, but somewhere in the, sort of the wastes of Russia. But yeah, the, the dogs are kind of equal characters with the humans and it's brilliantly done because there's a there's quite a few novels have been done with animals as the main characters but they're usually kind of either satires on you know Virginia Woolf's flush is looking at humans through the eyes of a dog and going oh well, aren't we silly when we look at ourselves from outside or just kind of cute and a bit twee and just oh isn't it isn't it funny to see what's going on inside an animal's head whereas Furukawa treats them with with deep respect and, and has them as as sentient and as clever and as deep and multifaceted faceted as any other human character and it's fascinating it's, it's a brilliant book it's very weird it's very um it's a very unusual way of telling the story but it's absolutely gripping all the way through and uh can't recommend it highly yeah. enough. Because <clears throat> I've said, I mean, I've probably said it in every podcast actually that, that one of the real benefits, it's a kind of benefit and not quite a curse, but it's the, or burden. The benefit is getting all these great recommendations, but then the burden is I've got to read them all and it's a <laughs> never ending pile. Yeah. But again, particularly, you know, if, if somebody like yourself can bring a book, to, not just to me, but to everybody who's listening, as you already touched on, that most of us, if not all of us, won't have heard of either the author or the book. That's a brilliant way of, of spreading the word. And as you say, but be just spreading what you've got from that book to other people. Yeah, and it's also because it's um, literature and translation. If people buy it, they're, they'll translate more of his books yeah. and they'll get more out there. Mm. He's he's prolific in Japanese, but there's only three of his books have ever been translated, and I'm desperate for more. <laughs> and other people yeah. should be. So you know, it's it's criminal how few books are translated into English every year. It's like a two percent of the the total something like that so yeah more 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 so that's uh, <laughs> belka why don't you bark and who would you say we say the name because sometimes when you print it i think the son name or the second name yeah so in, in japan they put the, the surname first the family name first and right. the given name second and it's often been the convention for us to switch to it. it yeah but the government's been discussing this recently and they're sort of keen to keep names in the Japanese order. So instead of referring to the Prime Minister as Shinzo Abe, as we would have done in the news, they would like us to refer to him as Abe Shinzo, mm-hmm. which seems eminently sensible to me. So, so hopefully, a few, to do it that way. hopefully a few more people will, will read Bill Cut, why don't you, Bart? Yeah. It's certainly, as you say, it sounds like a, a completely weird or unusual concept for a, yeah, a novel. Yeah, it's, it's very hard, as maybe it's come across, it's very hard to describe what it's about yeah. and what happens. You kind of have to just read it and experience yeah. it. But that's the thing, you know, as I say, people who are listening to this are generally interested in reading anyway, so it just provokes that curiosity. And I often think whether it's a, a name you don't know or sometimes maybe somebody's written a, a book that's completely different from what you're used to, you just want to go, well, I want to go and see what that's all about. Because if somebody like yourself is raving about it, you think, right, well, let's go and have a wee, 
yeah. see what, what the chat's about. Yeah, it's a great thing about this podcast. Like, um, the I've never read. I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Don Quixote. Don Quixote. Well, Chris Dolan. Uh, yeah. he, he gave me the Spanish and the yeah the, the English. So. Yeah, I can't remember, but yeah, I've never read it, and I've always put it off. But then you know, Chris was so evangelical about it. Yeah. I was like, right. Well, I can say I read to get around to it. So. He told me because it's, it's two books um, together because he wrote the first part and then he only wrote the second part because someone had almost written a spoof. Yeah. So I've read the first book and it is and it is as good as as Chris Fantastic. says. So I would certainly recommend that. Yeah, that's me for the the flight back to Japan. I'll excellent, <laughs> excellent. Yeah. It's always I always like this this point in the podcast where we go from a book where you're <laughs> evangelical about to a book that you couldn't be paid to read again. Yeah. This was the easiest one. <laughs> to Not know. everybody says that. Actually. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it, yeah. I can see how it would be difficult, but for me, this was just it took less than a second to decide. Um, <laughs> it, it must have had a really bad effect it was, on you then. It really did. Um, uh, Doctor Sachs by Jack Kerouac is is my one. I love Kerouac. I loved Kerouac when I was younger. I I very much fall into that sort of cliched. When I was a teenager, I read On the Road and it blew my mind and then I became obsessed with the Beats and yeah. Ginsburg and Burroughs mm. and, and all of that stuff and books like Dharma Bums and Desolation Angels the, the Kerouac books where he goes into solitude I've always liked where he goes up the mountains or, or goes into the forest I tried to read On the Road again recently and that, that didn't go well it hasn't it's, I think it's very much a young a young person's or maybe just a young man's book but Dr. Sachs I read when I was at university and I was very much in that I love the beats yeah. period and it's a hundred I think it's 118 pages and it took me six months to finish because I couldn't read more than a page or two at a time before throwing it across the room and but you discussed. persevered I persevered at that time I still very much believed in you have to finish a book yeah. if you start a book you have to finish a book I, I don't buy into that now because life's too short and there's too many books um, but I persevered and I'm kind of glad I did because now I can really rant about how bad it is knowing every single <laughs> page of it it's an awful book very little happens it kind of Jack Ker- Kerouac looking back at his own childhood and trying to turn some of his memories into a novel so a lot of it is about not <sighs> I guess he wasn't a very popular child or didn't have many friends and spent a lot of time alone in his room playing these... He invented, like, baseball and horse racing games, I think, like, card games and stuff like that. And they're thoroughly dull. He describes in great detail these invented games that don't make any sense and that even if you were to play them probably wouldn't be much fun, but just having someone else describe them to you are tedious and then there's, there's a whole thing where he fantasises about comic book characters and stuff like that. And it's basically just, I think by this point, Kerouac had bought into his own myth. That, that story of how he wrote On the Road in three weeks, just taking Benzedrine and coffee and wine and just typing, 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 isn't really true. It's pretty much been debunked that he prepared everything. He did, he did do the typing, and you can go and see the, the roll of paper in a museum but he'd prepared and made notes and knew exactly what he was going to write. And then he spent time afterwards editing and rewriting and redrafting. But he sort of developed this myth about the stream of consciousness and just writing on the road just flowed out of me as if dictated by the muse. And um, people loved that, people bought into it. But I think by the time he got round to Dr. Sachs, he was a bit worse for wear with the drink that would... Yeah, because I I read a quote, I can't remember who it was... He had written to it about that, but I, I don't know if he, I think he basically wrote it when he was in drugs. So, yeah. which again I've not read it, so I'm, I'm guessing maybe that's that was maybe part of the problem. Yeah, certainly his critical faculties probably weren't firing on all cylinders, and yeah, you can tell he's just going. Whatever I write will be gold, and and it's really really not. <laughs> it's it's so bad. He could not get me to read that again. That is unequivocal. Then that's yeah. actually I'm glad because I say some people are either reluctant to, to pick a book that they, they, for a whole variety of reasons, but I'm quite glad that you've no, nailed your colours to the that last. I've, I've never, I've, I have since read books that I've never finished. Yeah. Like, I'm not enjoying this, I don't like this, and stopped. But nothing that has kind of stayed with me as traumatically <laughs> as Dr. Sex has. I mean, in terms of, again, we spoke earlier on about your own writing, you've written three novels, now a memoir. Are you 
looking to go back in, in terms of looking back to, to writing another novel or is it just something, you know, you're always writing something and you just see what emerges? Yeah, I've always got a few things on the go. Part of what dictates what will come next is partly it's just the, the kind of market, the publishing industry and what happens. So just now literary fiction isn't selling very well. You know, crime fiction's massive, but literary fiction isn't. So publishers are reluctant to take on literary fiction. So I could write a literary novel that is great, but then lots of publishers would just knock it back on business grounds, which is, is fair enough. It's, yeah. It is a business. And, you know, if, if this book, it's too early to tell, but if this book is, is in any way successful, then there might be more interest in another book about Japan or more travel writing, that kind of thing. But I'm working on a science fiction novel just now, which um, I'd love to get published, and I'm working on a travel book about America, and I've kind of got all these things on the go at one time, and eventually at some point, either I'll decide or circumstances will decide, right, this is the one yeah. to pursue next. But I quite like that idea, because it, it means you're not pigeonholed, because obviously you've got novels, but particularly, you know, completely different subjects, you've now got that a memoir, you say you're maybe going into science fiction, so it's quite good for you, for you as a writer that people don't know what to expect next, but it doesn't yeah. constrain you then? It does, it's great for me, I've always loved it, and I, I, I'm, I'm not sure why it doesn't happen more, it happens in film, you know, you get somebody like Tarantino will do like a crime film and then a western and mm-hmm. then a samurai film mm-hmm. and then mix it all together, but publishers, I guess, publishers and readers tend to want writers to, to stay with one thing, because then you build up a readership, you know. Um, people who love crime novels, for example, will keep reading yeah. Ian Rankin because they know what they're getting. Whereas I've had people, in fact, I've had, I've had good friends say they love one of my books, but they can't stand one of the other ones because they don't like that genre. You know, I love The Waves Burn. They'd have to be really good friends to say that, well, yeah. <laughs> Or really bad friends. <laughs> oh, yes. yeah, yeah. But, or ex-friends. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, for me it's just... I can only write what I'm interested in yeah. and my interests mm. go in different directions and often skip about. So, you know, my first book, First Time Solo, was set in the Second World War. And when I was finished with that, I was like, OK, I don't want to write about the Second World War anymore. I want to try something different. So I went back to the it was the 18th century for Selma Hill and did mm-hmm. something completely different. It's, it's refreshing. I like that. So, yeah, I just keep working away and see what see what happens. Good, and I, I mean, as I say, I've, I've been lucky enough to read the memoir, and uh, I, I mean, I think people, I think people will enjoy, will engage with it because it, it gives you that real insight into life as uh, not as an outsider, but becoming an, an insider to an extent in, in a different culture, in a different country, completely different culture, obviously from Scotland. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's been interesting. Wr- writing a memoir has been has been difficult because. It's sort of, you never know if anybody's actually going to be interested, you know, all, all it's doing is basically me talking about me, and yeah. I find myself endlessly fascinated, <laughs> but I have no idea if anyone else ever So, was, so. Your, was your wife the first reader then of the book? Because obviously it's, your life is an integral part of hers and vice versa, particularly when you, when you moved to, to where you're staying now. Yeah, she wasn't so much, she's not, for the same reason I don't enjoy reading in Japanese that much, she doesn't enjoy reading in English much, because it's feels like study it's kind of hard work so um i ran everything by her and you know this, mm-hmm. th- because it's a true story you know her family and her father in particular are big characters in the book so i had to legally kind of had to run everything yeah. past people but um yeah she's she's reading it just now she just she just texted me this morning and said i finished the first chapter it's funny <laughs> like, okay good <laughs> great so, um, but yeah, she uh, she was the first reader of there's there's various bits in Japanese where you know use use the sentences and she checked all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Now my first my first readers I've got I've got a few friends who are writers. Yeah, that are you can trust them by, for their opinion. Yeah. yeah, and my agent who is fantastic and can be wonderfully blunt when someone's yeah. not which, good which, enough. Which you need. Exactly. Yeah. We're on to the, the fifth and final question of the podcast, and that is either the last book you read or the book that you're currently reading. Yeah, it's one I just finished, um, one I've reviewed, actually. It's um, The User's Guide to Make Believe by Jane Alexander. Um, I should dis- disclose, I, I know Jane. She's, mm. she's a friend. We both did the Creative Writing Masters at Glasgow together. But this isn't 
nepotism. This isn't me just bigging up a friend's book. It's fantastic. It's a really good book. Um, it's it's her second novel. Um, she published a novel called The Last Treasure Hunt five years ago, I think, which is literary fiction. And this new one is kind of speculative science fiction thriller, I guess. And it's fantastic. If anybody likes it, this is kind of a lazy comparison, um, but if anybody likes Black Mirror, this thing, this book will be for you. It's absolutely You fantastic. do realise you've been going through compared to things. I know. That <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's um, it's so easy to do and it's, it's, it is... A, I suppose it's to get you... I think, to be fair, it's you to, to give people an idea of roughly pitching it as to, to where people should be thinking where, it, where the yeah, book is. Yeah, exactly. It, it is a convenient way of, of doing it, but yeah, every time I do it, I sort of cringe <laughs> inside and return it down. Um, but it's not... It, like it's in that ballpark but it's his own thing it's yeah. um it's set slightly in the future there's technology um that allows us sort of virtual reality reality technology that allows people to create their own fantasy worlds whatever you can imagine you experience and as always in these kind of stories it's run by a face faceless horrible bureaucratic capitalist company that turns out to be not the nicest people in the world and doing secret horrible things so it's uh, it's one of these David and Goliath stories one poor woman fighting against this raging against this big machine and it's just brilliant it's it's captivating it's gripping it's it's a proper thriller um, in that sense but it's also got so much heart there's human relationships at the at the center of the the novel and Jane Alexander is brilliant at writing relationships, real vivid relationships that everybody can immediately recognise. And it's it's just out kind of nowish. In fact, I think tonight, as we record this, there's a book launch for it in Edinburgh. Because I wonder, and again, I've asked various people, just in general terms, but quite specific for you then as a, as a, as a reader and a, also a reviewer of a book of something you know, that's a real pressure. Yeah, it can be. Um, I have a general policy because um, because I write for a newspaper, an actual print newspaper with column inches and ink. Um, I try not to review something I really don't like. Mm-hmm. I don't see the point in wasting limited space in a newspaper telling people not to read something. You can use that space to tell them to read something else instead. So yeah, there's 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 that, but also. I guess I've had I've had people say this to me that it's it's hard to um, separate me from my books that they'll read them. So my my third novel, The Waves Burn Bright, the one of the main characters is a woman, and a few of my my early readers, a few of my friends read it, and they're like, I didn't realise it was a woman until like page three because I just heard your voice mm-hmm. when I was reading it. Um, I've I've never really had that with readers. I can I can read my friend stuff kind of objectively. I've worked as an editor in a few places, a few publishing companies and things and um, yeah, that kind of objectivity of just going, the writer doesn't matter, I'll focus on this but then the great part is, when you get to the end of a good book, you can turn back to the writer and go, this is amazing yeah. you've, done, you've done a great job So Because Chris Dolan, who was on the first podcast and, and he's hosting your event at I Write and he always tells me the story of when his first novel came out and a friend of his at the time, which will tell you everything that's going to happen in the story, was looking to get into book review, and so Chris had put a, a word in with the Herald, and the guy reviewed Chris's book, and then absolutely panned it. Oh, God. <laughs> so it was the end of our friendship, and I think he was kind of taken aback, and maybe, maybe not looking for a kind of sycophantic review, but I thought, fairness, and he, he was completely taken aback. So there's this, there is that. I mean, the guy was being completely and brutally honest, but, I, you know... yeah. I you want. I mean, if if you're going to be, if you have to be negative, you have to be negative about something. And I have written quite damning reviews, but you still try to be balanced. Mm-hmm. Even though I may hate something, somebody else will absolutely yeah. love it. Um, How do you feel about the views of, of your own books? Um, <laughs> yeah, I I want to say I don't read them, but of course I read them. Yeah. <laughs> of course I do. I try and find them, and um, sometimes. You know, if they're good, they're great, and you're you're happy for the rest of the day. Sometimes they they come up with things that I'd never even thought about, and that can be interesting. I've only had one absolute hatchet job of a of a review, and that was uh, that was from my first book, and that was destroying. That was that was awful. It was in the Guardian, 
Right. I was like, oh, I'm in the car. Oh, my <laughs> God. And that, that was horrible. Um, That's tough, especially if it is, but it's your first novel, as you say. Yeah, yeah. and it was, I, I feel, I mean, I, I suppose every writer who gets a bad review thinks it's unfair, but the things the reviewer picked up on to criticise, I think, were pretty unfair. If you don't like the plot or you don't like the characters or something, then fine, criticise that. But, yeah, I guess I'm not unbiased in <laughs> rejecting but I like, I like your, but what you were saying earlier on, uh, that idea of, particularly in print newspapers, because space is at a premium, that why would you fill your pages full of things to tell readers, yeah. don't read this, don't read that? It, it should be positive, critical, but in a positive yeah. way. Yeah, there's, there's so many books out there. Yeah, that, and yeah. so you know, I, I review for the Japan Times and most of the time we only get 250 words. You, you can't be critical in 250 words. Once you've explained the plot and said whether it's good or bad, you're done. Mm-hmm. You're out of words. So if there's only that space, two 250-word reviews, why waste it? Why say this is a bad book, ignore it, when there's been 50 other books published that day that, that could be better? And you're in, as I mentioned right at the very start, you're, you're here in Glasgow just now, you're on this book tour for the only guide in, in the, the village. What has been the response so far when you've been doing readings and, and been at various events? It's been great. It's um, the, book, the book is mostly sort of funny, humorous. There's a, lot, there's a lot of comedy in it. So when I've been reading bits out, I guess it's like a stand-up comedian trying new material. You don't mm. know it's actually funny until people in the room laugh and that's been happening people laughing at the at the right bits so so that's been good we haven't had haven't had many reviews out yet we're sort of in that period where the book's kind of out but the reviews aren't yet so wait and see what the critics think of it but yeah so far it's been it's been positive and i was telling you before we we started recording that i had been reading there was a section in your book and i'd been out and i'd moved the car outside and i came back in wandering through the house in my shoes and it, it, it made me laugh i was telling my wife i just read the bit in your book where you know, in Japanese households, there's always a right at the front door where you, you would take your shoes off and, you know, people in Japan would be asking you what, why we would just walk into the house and drag all the dirt behind us. And actually, when you read that, you go, I don't know why we do that. Yeah, it's it's one of the great things about, about travel and particularly about living abroad is how much it makes you question things you take for granted from where you're from. So I would go to Japan and people would say, well, why do people not take their shoes off when they go inside? And you watch films and they've got their kids are on the bed with their shoes on or their mm-hmm. feet up on the table <clears> with their <throat> dirty boots on. And I literally have no answer. You know, why, why don't we take our shoes off? We've been walking through the mud, walking through whatever, and then you drag it into your house and put it up on your sofa and there is no reason yeah. I can think of. And particularly now, you know, we're recording this in the middle of the, the coronavirus scare where everyone's, you know, wash your hands, use sanitizer, things like that. And we should be doing that all the time, you know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. the, out, the outside can be a dirty place. Yeah. So. Well, I'm glad at least you, you managed to make it over from Japan to, to Glasgow yeah. for this podcast, as well as, as for promoting your book. Yeah, I made it over. I don't know if I'll make it back. <laughs> I might have to stay a bit longer. Well, listen, we've got the podcast recording now, so that's, yeah. I'm happy. So, <laughs> Great. Well, listen, thanks very much, Ian, for, for joining us. If anybody wants to hear uh, or read of any of Ian's choices, you can go onto my website, www.paulcuddehy.com there's a page for each of the individual guests so I've put all the, the book choices there and also the only Gaijin in the village by Polygon Books is out now so go and buy it because it is a, a belter of a memoir but Ian thanks for joining us Thank you Paul, thanks for having me on Thanks for listening to the Read All About It podcast and I'd love to hear what you thought about it You can get in touch via Twitter at Read All About 20 on Instagram at Read All About It podcast or you can send an email to readallaboutit at paulcuddehy.com. If you've enjoyed the podcast, subscribe, leave a review and spread the word. If you haven't enjoyed it, say nothing to anybody. But I do hope you can join me, Paul Cuddehy, next time on the Read All About It podcast. And in the meantime, keep reading. Keep reading.